What's going on, Panthers Nation? It's Aaron Duncan here, back again with another Panthers video brought to you by Necessary Bluntness Sports Talk. And today we are doing another one of the episodes that we run down what happened in practice today. Today is the eighth practice so far in Wofford. And it got real. Full pads again, of course. This is the day before Fan Fest, so you know that coaches want to crank it up. Because Fan Fest is typically just a little display and fireworks and all this kind of emphasis stuff. Just to just to let the fans get involved and the players get some shine and stuff. It's not that high uh, intensity of a practice. So you know they wanted to crank it up the day before. And for what it sounded like, today was a big emphasis on team periods and scrimmage periods. But before we get into that, guys, make sure you hit the subscribe button below and give the video a thumbs up too. Because I want you guys to subscribe because I drop all kind of updates like this. I do videos and analysis and breakdowns, podcasts, live streams. And once the season cranks up, it's going to get even more real, especially with all this stuff happening for day to day. You got to make sure you keep up. So hit the subscribe button and the bell icon. That way you get a notification. And you won't miss any videos. So I really appreciate that. So that was a cool day because, like I said, right after warmups, they got into different situational football uh, scenarios, I guess. So they did a lot of uh, red zone, of course, regular two minute drills, just any kind of different spots on the field, either going out, coming in, different kind of scenarios, just to kind of knock these guys out of their routine of doing the individual drills, the one-on-ones, the inside runs, the nine-on-sevens. They wanted to mix it up and give these guys a chance just to play football and compete and get those juices flowing. So it was a good time out there. And obviously, David Tepper and Scott Fitterer, the GM and owner of this team, were in attendance. A lot of people were rumoring on Twitter that they were sitting there talking uh, about possibly making a Deshaun Watson trade, but that's neither here nor there. But it was just interesting to see, obviously, the big man, I guess they call him the big cat now because he owns the team, come down out of the corporate office and put his eyes and feet on the grass and see what's going on here at camp the day before Fan Fest. So it was definitely eyes on the team, and they wanted to put on a show. But, of course, I always start on the injury front just to talk about who wasn't. At practice this time, it was uh, Darius Clark was out. A.J. Bouye is dealing with a soft in- tissue injury. Shaq Thompson was out once again, but he was upgraded to a green jersey, meaning that he was limited, and it seems like he may be returning soon. De- uh, Denzel Perriman was out again with another soft tissue injury, and Matt Rule alluded that it was a mix between, um, I guess, either groin and hamstrings for all these guys. Of course, A.J. Bouye is looking like it's going to be an extended period of time of him being out. So, of course, J.C. Horn was going to have to be up anyway. So I guess the bright side is if AJ's injury leaks into the regular season or whatever way, he's going to be suspended the first two weeks anyway. But you definitely want to have him in there to build that chemistry with the secondary, regardless of when J.C. Horn is expected to be the full-time starter, um, because we know A.J. Boya is going to eventually be the nickel cornerback in this defense. Um, and of course, but uh, Austin Larkin, the defensive end, he got injured and the cart ended up coming out. They're saying that it was a groin injury. And, of course, Keith Kirkwood is out because of the concussion after getting hit earlier this week in that scary incident. So the injury front is looking kind of weird. And, of course, like I said, the line if you notice, there was two linebackers that were out. So that left Clay Johnson to be the middle linebacker taking the reps. And i got a video coming out soon that's going to be talking about should the Panthers be concerned about the linebacker position because of these type of injuries. So stay tuned for that. But like I said, today was a big emphasis on situations. And the one of the big situations that stuck out just from what I was hearing is the red zone and Sam Donald's production in the red zone and how much practice they've been doing in the red zone. Shout out to Teddy Bridgewater on that because uh, they definitely put some emphasis on that and they definitely sounded like they did pretty good with Sam Donald finding a connection with Dan Arnold. Say that three times fast. Nevertheless, the fact to see that Dan Arnold, such a big target, is making a good connection with Sam, especially in the red zone, is a relief because we know we had some of the worst production from the tight end position last year between Ian Thomas and Chris Manhurst. Obviously, we brought in Tommy Trimble and Dan Arnold. Dan Arnold is a much better, reliable receiving target, but some of these guys lack in different areas. Obviously, Tommy Trimble is a better blocker, not that great of a receiver. Dan Arnold is about there to catch passes, not so much in the blocking game. Ian Thomas. He's somewhere in between, but apparently he's been progressing and doing better. So hopefully the competition will bring out the best in him. But Dan Arnold is a welcome sight that we have a big target that we can rely on in that red zone. Nevertheless, he wasn't just the only one. Robbie was making catches in the red zone that looks pretty good in some short areas. DJ was catching passes. Darnold was finding the running backs with Chuba, making a one-hand catch and getting in the end zone. The same thing for Christian McCaffrey. So it seems like even though the deep ball is not there for Sam Darnold, he's been able to string together two consecutive quality practices where he looks comfortable and he's getting completions in the short intermediate game. That can go a long way because... 
it's not the fact that he can't go downfield like we had with Teddy Bridgewater. It's just you want him to learn how to pick guys apart in the short and intermediate because we have the talented guys that can make plays after that. And when you can improve in the short and intermediate, that can translate over into the red zone also. So it's good to see that because we know the red zone was a lot of the reason why we lost some games because kicking field goals will get you beat in the NFL. So being putting that emphasis on the red zone again, like I said, shout out to Teddy Bridgewater, and seeing us actually be pretty crisp, is a good feeling to have. And like I said, Sam Donald does have that arm strength to be able to do it. So I think hopefully the deep ball will come eventually and he will connect on some of those, even though that's something he's always struggled in his career thus far. But hopefully as things progress and the chemistry builds, he'll start to uh, connect on some of those long passes because we have enough speed on the outside to make things happen. But it's still good to see that he's been doing good in that red zone. Some place that we struggle and some places has been receiving some criticism from the outside because the coaches haven't really been focusing on that. But that's another story for another day, of course. Another thing I noticed was, of course, the talk about discipline from Matt Rule. We saw earlier this week with JT eBay getting cut after kind of leveling Keith Kirkwood, of course. And we, we, we talked about that in the live stream about was it was the, uh, was it warranted or not. And a lot of people were saying that Matt Rule was just trying to send a message that eBay was going to get cut anyway. So it may send a message that, hey, guys, we need to be disciplined and take care of each other and just not do that type of stuff in practice and be smart enough. And I get it. Now, about sending these type of messages, I mean, it, you see what he's saying. I mean, they've implemented some new policies, some new things that – can punish the players and remind them of why they need to be disciplined. And that thing is they started with running laps, but according to Matt Rule, they wanted to change that up because the coach on the staff and they've been doing this thing called the DBO sign. And uh, I'll play a clip right here that shows what it's talking about a little bit. One of the first tenet of our plan to win is that don't beat ourselves. Uh, Matt Lombardi on our staff, that was actually his idea. You know, we had been taking just taking a lap and then we said, hey, let's put something on the practice field and, you know, so that they run to it just to remind themselves like, hey, this is how we're going to win games, right? By not jumping off sides, by not having penalties. And as you can see, the message is clear. I get it. You don't want to beat yourself because a lot of football games are lost rather than won. And what I mean by that is you do things to shoot yourself in the foot. You take bad penalties. You take bad mistakes. You make mental mistakes. Coaches are overcoaching or mismanaging the clock. They make bad decisions in certain scenarios. A lot of games are lost. So don't beat ourselves is a big emphasis. And I like the message. But how the message is implemented, it's a little bit different story. But the funny thing is, Cam Irving has gotten very familiar with the DBO sign. He's ran a lot of laps there. A lot of the running joke on Twitter is that if he has to run any more laps to the DBO sign, he's going to lose enough weight to be a tight end by the season, and we're going to be looking for a starting left tackle. Nevertheless, apparently Cam Irving, who has some criticism coming into this because they didn't think he could be that good, has actually been pretty solid along with Trent Scott, the backup. So that competition, we'll see what will happen when we go against somebody in a different color jersey, whether it's preseason or joint practices. But it's good to see that somebody that we were kind of skeptical about is actually holding his own in practice because we have some good edge rushers. If you can hold up against these type of guys like Brian Burns and Hassan Riddick, you're going to be able to do a pretty good job against a lot of different types of defensive ends in the NFL. But I thought it was just interesting about this coaching style because – we saw, obviously, the Lions and their crazy new coach that came from the Saints, Dan Campbell. They had them doing up-downs when they did something wrong, and they had them running laps when they do something wrong. We saw the Giants have a brawl earlier this week, and they had to run gassers, which is fine because those aren't. that's not a mental mistake. That's just losing your cool and fighting somebody. So you don't want that type of stuff. So I get that. But for Matt Rule, for false starts and stuff, and those type of penalties that happen, for somebody to have to take a rep, I mean, uh, take a, a lap, his, his philosophy is, hey, if they have to take a lap, that means they're losing reps and they're not getting better and they're not getting a chance to prove themselves. And I guess, but that seems like, uh, does, that, does that message get across to the players? And they seem to be receiving it pretty well, but how would that translate to the field? But I also noticed that the New York Jets head coach, Robert Sala, or Sala, whatever his name is, had a different perspective when it comes to punishing players for mental mistakes with laps. I'll go ahead and play that clip right here. Of like, what's your philosophy, Robert? Sort of the same lines of like penalty laps or penalty push ups or, or doing kind of like disciplinary things in practice, like that sort of stuff. Um, you know, there, there's, there's many ways to do it. There are, there, there are many ways to do it. For me, um, you know, it, it's more of accountability, try to, try to create accountability with self uh, rather than forcing accountability. Uh, these players are, are grown men and that uh, to give them the opportunity to correct it themselves will always happen first. Uh, obviously, there's going to be coaching. You know, there, 
they're not, they're not trying to make the mistake. Uh, all we can do is help them understand how the mistake was made so they don't do it again. And to be honest, when he talks about it, it's very interesting take on it. And I actually understand what he's saying. These guys are grown men. They're not college players when this and that. These are grown men. They should be able to know how to self-govern themselves. Obviously, like I said, when it comes to things like the giant situation where it's a big brawl and your, your quarterback gets caught up in the pile. Yeah, you want to punish them with gases because that's just uncalled for. But penalties like false starts and offsides and stuff like that that's lack comes from discipline. Does punishment really help that you know i mean we can break it down to the to the to the controversy of should you whoop your kids or is that really helping does associating pain and punishment like that really help get the message across and i i'm not i don't have any kids so i'm not going to argue that but i think it's an interesting take to say that hey these guys are grown men i'm not going to punish them for something that simple if they do something that's out of character like fighting that's a different story but just something simple as jumping off sides or something that was an accident they're not going to punish them with that so we'll see which style of coaching will prevail if, I mean, obviously we're going to see that pretty quick because we played the Jets in week one, but for the long term, we'll see if this stuff continues to happen or if it's something that really uh, sways those results in one way or another. So fun fact of the day for the Carolina Panthers is today is the 10th anniversary of ESPN Stats quarterback rating, aka the QBR, and since they've been implementing it, the lowest score for a season in history is Jimmy Clausen. None other than the Panthers quarterback at 13.8. And that's just like, it brings back bad memories because the 2010 season was just terrible as a whole. Nevertheless, a lot of people are saying, hey, we had to go through that growing pain because it led to something better. And that led to us getting the number one overall pick and leading to Cam Newton, who gave us a slew of all kinds of memories and victories and uh, brought our franchise into another level when it comes to notoriety, fame, and fun and all that. So I just thought it was interesting that he had the lowest QBR in history, and I was just like 13. Like on a scale of 1 to 100, he's 13. 13. I thought you'd get a little bit of credit. I thought you'd get 20 points just to write your name on the paper, you know, just for starting, you know, but I guess not. And so Jimmy Gunner Jimmy and Jimmy Clausen was not a name that I was expecting to hear on a day like today, but. It is what it is. So you guys let me know down below in the comments how you felt about the team's practice today and all the comp competition, how you feel about what they've been saying about Sam, about him looking pretty good for these two days. Obviously, we have to wait and see more in preseason and when it comes to these joint practices, going against somebody that you don't see every day. But it has to be promising to see that he's been making some progress and taking these coaching and taking advantage of these new weapons and the new opportunity that he has here in Charlotte with the Carolina Panthers. So let me know down below in the comments how you feel about that. But without further ado, I'm Aaron Duncan signing off. I'll see you next time. Peace.